we last left, we were talking about how President FDR brought forth the New Deal during the Great Depression to try to bring relief, recovery, and reform to the United States. In doing so, he expands the power of the federal government. But also, at the same time, a lot of his uh, programs were shot down by a very conservative Supreme Court who still believed in the laissez-faire, or hands-off view uh, of, of government being involved in the economy. So um, FDR and Congress, which was at that time very much the same party as he was, they were upset with that, and so they wanted to try to enlarge the size of the Supreme Court from nine justices to 13. This is called court packing. And even though Roosevelt was popular, his court packing plan was not. And a lot of people, and even the public, expressed outrage over the suggestion of a tampering with an institution of government like the Supreme Court. How many justices does the Constitution say the Supreme Court should have? It does not say. Oh, it doesn't say. In fact, when it was first created, the Supreme Court had five under Washington's administration with the Judiciary Act of 1789. But it, since then, it has expanded to currently. We have nine justices, and at that time it was nine, and he wanted to expand it to 13. Why would he do that? Why would, what's, how is expanding it going to help him? Once he expands it, he would have a power. Over appointing these justices. That's right. How do you be, who would become a member of who would be how do you would like if he goes from nine to fourteen, who pick nine to thirteen, who picks those four people? The, the president. The and so that would that, he's gonna pick people that would endorse his New Deal uh, practices. So um, that his uh, his court packing idea gets shot down and but it's still even though a lot of his his New Deal programs get shot down as well by the Supreme Court. It still changed the, the way the federal government operates, even up to today. It makes it much, much, much larger. Okay? <clears throat> All right, now let's talk about money. Money, money, money. And the way money exchanges hands between the federal government and the state government. All right? For the most part, today, the national government will provide grants. A, think of a grant as just a money that exchanges hands from one person to another. That is a grant. Now, if I were to say, okay, I have, I have uh, a $20 bill right here. Crisp, brand new $20 bill. All right? And I say, here, Nick, here is $20. You spend it on anything you want to spend it on. Okay? That is just a fully, uh, fully funded, no restrictions grant to Nick. He can do whatever he wants with it. But if I were to say, here's $20, Nick, you have, but you have to spend it on a certain thing, that would be a type of grant that we're going to talk about. Or if I said, okay, Nick, you know what? You haven't been taking your notes very well lately, and so I'm not going to give you this $20. But if you start taking them, here's your $20. That's something the federal government will also do to states. Withhold money to, if, the go, if the states are not doing something they want them to do. Okay? So let's take a look at the way money exchanges hands. Because this is federal money to states. That's, this is totally federalism. Okay? The division of power between the state and federal government. Alright, so... <clears throat> uh, first, let's look at categorical grants. Categorical grants. Categorical grants are grants for which Congress appropriates funds for specific purposes. So I'll be like, okay, Nick, here's $20, and you can buy school clothes with it. And he can only buy clothes that he wears to school. That's what he has to do. Go, the federal government will do that as well. They'll say, here's, here's $100 million. Use it to improve your infrastructure or use it to... Give teachers a raise, or use it for improving school buildings, or use it for whatever. But it'll get it'll have a specific purpose, a categorical grant. Raleigh County Schools has received a categorical grant recently, and the fact that you guys don't have to pay for any meals anymore. Did you guys know that? Like you can get any meal, bre breakfast or lunch is totally free for you, because money has been appropriated for that purpose. It was given to the state by the federal government, 
and it had a, it was a categorical like here you have to use this for school lunches, school food to feed for feeding children at public school. All right, so the state could not have taken that money and said, okay, instead of doing that, we're going to build roads. They could not have done that because it had a category it had a category that associated with it. So. <clears throat> Uh, categorical grants are subject to detailed conditions imposed by the federal government. They often, sometimes like the federal, when the states want something, like if they want to encourage something, they'll ask for the federal government to match. Like we've got some money saved up for building roads, and we want you to help match it. So, and the federal government will, will do that from time to time. Now, we're, usually a lot of money is at stake with these categorical grants. We're talking millions, if not billions, of dollars for some programs. And um, these grants become much more prominent under the leadership of pre President, you guys know who this is? Lyndon Baines Johnson. Lyndon Baines Johnson. He, he likes to uh, use court categorical grants because he wanted to be able to coerce the states into cooperating with what he wanted to accomplish, okay? So when he, when he began a crusade on, the war, what, which, on which he called the War on Poverty in his Great Society program, he really used categorical grants to get uh, states and even cities involved, okay? Because what his Great Society program was a broad attempt to combat poverty and discrimination through urban renewal urban renewal and he's going to do that with education reform and unemployment relief and these grants were really was one of the biggest government programs since really the new deal and um, and so states and localities if they wanted to get access to this money that the federal government was offering they had to do things with that money, like do urban renewal, re re revitalize their cities, use it for schools in order to combat poverty. And that's, that's how they would get the money. Right? So, but they only got it if they, did the, if they spent it the way President Johnson wanted them to spend it. Right? So it's kind of coercive. Like the federal government is coercing the states to do things. But, you know, it's usually good. I mean, it's not like... Here's money when you got to go build you know, houses of ill repute. Okay? So, so Lyndon B. Johnson want his state to integrate schools. Mm -hmm. Could he use categorical He could have. He could have. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. Um, it, it, it could be. That could oh, be okay. a very good example. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, but a, lot, a lot of the. Usually, the federal government cannot control, does not really control. You know, education is, is controlled by states. Now, the, the federal government could use categorical grants to coerce the states to do certain things. Like, we're, we're definitely, like, you guys know we have links every day, right? We get money for that. And if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have links because how important is links? And how well, how well do we utilize it? You can answer. It's not very well utilized, okay? But the only, and the only reason we have is because we're getting money for it, okay? So um, that's just kind of how it works. You know, sometimes functions in government run very well and run very smoothly, and other times we're just checking a box, and it's bureaucracy, okay? You'll, you'll find this out as you get older and, you know, experience government more. All right? <clears throat> Another type was block grants. Block grants. And block grants were really uh, a favorite of this man. That is, when the time he liked block grants was during his time as governor of California. Governor of California, Ronald Reagan. Because, but when he became president, he began to advance what he called new federalism. New federalism. This is a relationship between the states and the federal government that he proposes, which he wants to return a lot of powers to the states. President Reagan was of what, which political party? He's a Republican, and Republicans are traditionally 
fall where on the political spectrum? Um, the left. That's Which is state control, states have conservative. And so if you're going to remember the shampoo bottle, if you're going to when you wash your hair and it says use conservatively, how much are you going to use? Very little. Very little. And that's how he felt the federal government should be involved. Now that doesn't mean that he didn't want things to get done, but he thought things should get done through who? The states. And so he wanted to return power to the states. And the way in which he planned to do this, the hallmark of this action was to use less restrictive block grants. Block grants. This is just large amounts of money given to states with only general spending guidelines. Okay? Much of the money that was given in block grants goes went toward education and health care. Health care. Which is really the two largest expenses of states. Medic Medicaid and education. All right, so who do you think really, really likes block grants? Republicans. More specific. How about governors? Because they're just yeah, given. Yeah, they they're given money, and then they can do what with it? Pretty much what they want with it, as long as it's for a general. It's for a general need. Okay, so if you get a block grant from the federal government that says. Do this to help your citizens. Could you do whatever you wanted with it? Yeah, you could literally do anything you wanted with it. But usually it was more general. Like, use this for education. Well, if you wanted to give all your superintendents a raise, could you do that? Could you hire more cooks? Could you buy more textbooks? Could you build a new school? Yeah, it's very general in, in scope. Okay, so governors really like block grants because they get to make the determination for where the money goes and how it gets spent. So um, these reforms were, um, you know, very popular with governors, and they wanted more block grants. And so governors even take this not just to, for education, but they wanted to begin to apply it to things like welfare. And um, these things ultimately get realized by the Speaker of the House in the 19. Uh, 90s, mid 1990s. You guys remember who that was? Newt, Newt Gingrich. Yes. Newt Gingrich, where, he, um, in a, in a, he was in charge of a Republican-controlled Congress. The Republican, Newt, Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, and the President of the United States at the time in the mid 90s, William Jefferson Clinton. They replaced uh, the existing federal welfare program with a program known as the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, T-A-N-F, the T-A-N-F, which returned much of the administrative power for welfare programs to the states. So between Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton doing a couple of these actions, this is known as the, de the Devolution Revolution, the Devolution Revolution. Devolution is like evolution with a D at the beginning, and revolution is evolution with an R. The devolution, devolution, revolution. It essentially what this is doing is just returning power to the states. Okay. All right. Now, <clears throat> another component of Congress's efforts to devolve greater authority back to the state governments, and this happened during the nineties was the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. The Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. What this does is this act prevents Congress from passing costly federal programs unless the states debate about it. What was the name of it again? The Unfunded Mandates Reform Act of 1995. And what it does is, is it prevents Congress from passing any kind of federal program without debate on how, much, how to fund them without input from state governments. So unfunded mandates are exactly what they sound like. This is something that, all right, so the federal government passes a program. Okay, states, we have just passed this program. You must do this. 
You must instill this program in your state. And oh, by the way, we are not giving you any money for it. That is an unfunded mandate. One common example of an unfunded mandate was the No Child Left Behind Act in education, all right, of 2001, which is now part of the amended Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. But what this does is basically just a host of federal requirements on everything from class size to accountability in testing. And although the federal government set these in increased standards, States charged that Congress did not consider the cost of these dramatic adjustments, which were passed on to the states, localities, and the people. So it was a very expensive program, which made education much, much larger. All right? And a lot of things changed as a result of it. Like when I was in school here, Students that were in general ed did not go to the same classrooms as students that were in special ed. In there was no such thing as inclusion, okay? But now, after because of this, they say students that are, you know, no, everybody gets to go to the same classrooms, okay? Like there was, there's no such really thing as a special ed classroom anymore, other than Miss um, Piercy, which you know, Ms. those are very low functioning students and they need special assistance okay but now there's no special ed classrooms everybody goes as it's included that is something that was included as part of the no child left behind act and it actually is more expensive to do that way because more people are required you know because some people have to be followed around you know so um and all of this had to be paid for by the states even though it was required by the federal government it's the bill has to be paid for by the states. That is the very definition of an unfunded mandate. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. So let's look at uh, the different courts of, of recent years. All right? You know, your book talks about William Rehnquist's court and then the present Supreme Court Chief Justice, uh, John Roberts. We'll start with, with uh, William Rehnquist. Beginning in the late 1980s, uh, with, with, with William Rehnquist's court, the court begins to allow Congress to, to change. All right? Mainly, this is a result of a group of new appointees that Ronald Reagan made in the late 1980s, including Justices Sandra Day O'Connor, who was the first female Supreme Court Justice, is this a shift in ideology? It is, because these are all conservative judges. They're very conservative. Uh, so Sandra Day O'Connor is this lady right here. This is William Rehnquist, by the way. I don't know if you guys can see a pointer. It's on his forehead. Yeah. And then Sandra Day O'Connor. Then this gentleman here, Antonin Scalia. Antonin, A-N-T-O-N. I am Antonin Scalia. Was Rehnquist appointed by Reagan? Uh, no. I didn't. Okay. okay. No. I he was the Chief Justice, oh, and Chief these Justice. are the appointments made by Reagan. Okay. So Sandra Day O'Connor, Antonin Scalia, and this gentleman here, Justice Kennedy. Anthony Kennedy. And all three of these conservative judges were very much committed to the idea of the notion of states' rights and rolling back on federal intervention. And the, the leadership of conservative William Rehnquist only served to intensify this change in perspective. So federalism is challenged a, a, a significant bit in the future as a result of these people serving on the Supreme Court. For example, in a Supreme Court case of the United States versus Lopez in 1995, which involved the conviction of a student charged with carrying a concealed handgun onto school property. So basically, you know, the kid brought a gun to school, all right, and the, the majority of the court ruled that Congress lacked constitutional authority under the Commerce Clause to regulate guns within a thousand feet of school. Is there anyone against? 
they're they're making this a a commerce like they're saying the commerce clause. All right. So now that's what you know, a, a five person majority of the court ruled that the Congress lacked authority to regulate guns within a thousand feet of school. Basically, they're saying that. You know, even though gun control laws are well intentioned, even when they're involving schools, they're not substantially rated, related to interstate commerce. And so, therefore, the federal government's not going to rule on this. It'll be left up to the states. So, essentially, their ruling is we're not going to rule. So, they send it back to the. They, they let the states determine for themselves. And that's why different states have different gun control laws. Like some. You know, like Plaxico Burris in New York shot himself on accident in New York, and he spent time in prison. Whereas if you shoot yourself here, somebody's just going to make fun of you, and you go to the hospital and get patched up, and it's probably it. You know, nothing, nothing will have really happen as a result of it. All, all because of different uh, strictness, um, different levels of strictness for when it comes to the control of guns. All right, and that's that's because of the conservative court. It's not that you know they are either pro gun or anti gun. It's more of a federalism thing. They want to let the states decide. The very lesser hands off control. All right. In John Roberts Supreme Court, following the death of Chief Justice William Rehnquist, President George W. Bush appointed J Chief Justice John Roberts to be the head of the Supreme Court. And in the years to follow, a number of other changes in the composition of the court, including the appointment of Justice Samuel Alito. This is John Roberts right here. And then this is Samuel Alito. And then there were some liberal justices who were appointed during the Obama administration, like Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan by President Obama. So in, in its earlier years, the Roberts Court appeared tentative toward high-profile cases. When it was, if it was pretty high-profile, they, they didn't really get involved much. But the court thrust itself into federalism, into the federalism debate when it came between the balance of national and state power, especially when it came to issues like immigration, redistricting, and health care especially health care. And the Roberts Court typically sided with the power of the national government, making the federal government a little bit more strong. But all in all, the Supreme Court typically tries to interpret the law appropriately and apply it and, and really follow the will of the people. Okay? Okay. Okay, last little bit here. Last little bit I want to talk to you about is progressive federalism. Now, progressive federalism is like a pragmatic approach to federalism. Like we know the federal government can make the states do what they want by holding money or giving money. That's a fact. Progressive federalism, federalists say that's okay. Sometimes you got to do that. Federal government, like progressive federalists, will also say, you know what? Sometimes I think the states are better equipped to handle things, so let's just let the states do it. That is what progressive federalism is. It's just a pragmatic approach. Instead of it being all or one, like dual federalism, it's a mix. It's a total mix. And during his first term as president. President Obama appeared very receptive to this pragmatic role of the federal government. And he was an advocate, meaning he was on the side of progressive federalism when it came to, he believed the, the relationship between the states and the federal government could and should be both coercive and cooperative. It's just, he's just doing what he thinks is best for each individual occasion. So... Um, it really, this form is really taken by the relationship. It depends on the political environment on each of each level of government. So you, you have to reach a consensus. You have to meet a, 
reach a general agreement between the states and the federal government. And that's, that's kind of how progressive federalism is supposed to work. However, failing the national government's ability to enact particular proposal, national policymakers may embrace states' efforts. And, as, and some the national governments may sometimes favor other states over some states over others, particularly when the power in those states you know, is pretty high. So <clears throat> the most visible attempt that President Obama made to create a national mandate was the passage of the 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. Obamacare. Okay? Part of this, what this is, what, is it a sta what this does, it established a variety of mechanisms to ensure that nearly all Americans had access to health insurance. I don't know if you guys have ever been sick or had to go to the doctor, but if you have to go to the doctor and spend a, you know, the hospital for a couple days, three days, it could bankrupt you easily if you have no health insurance. Now, you're going to get the treatment one way or another, but it could literally ruin your, your finances for the rest of your life if you get sick and you don't have health insurance, especially if you have a job where, you know, you work at Walmart, which most, that's one of the highest employers in America. So part of this health care reform was to include significant changes in Medicaid. Now, you guys know the difference between Medicaid and Medicare? Isn't Medicaid for, isn't it geared towards low-income Okay. And Medicare is for the elderly? Okay. Medicaid is ran by the states. Oh. And it's, that's like people who are, you know, have disabilities mm -hmm. or have been injured or, um, yeah, it's, it's state-operated health care. Medicare is like what through Social Security, like when you get a certain age. So Medicare is for elderly people. Medicaid is for disabled people. Okay, so like if I, you know, get in a car accident on the way home and I'm, you know, cut my larynx, I'm never able to speak again. I'm not going to be a very effective teacher, so I be, won't be able to work. I, I could get Medicaid and that would help me, okay? So that's just an example. I'm not... Hoping for that or anything. Yeah. So um, so Medicaid is state operated and it's for disability. Medicare is federal and it's age related. All right. So part of President Obama's health care legislation included significant changes to Medicaid. So he's getting involved in state operated things. And almost immediately after the ink was dry, on the president's signature on the act, uh, a group of state governments challenged the constitutionality of it because he's trying to tell the states what they can do. Is, what did he try to do? Did he try to expand Medicaid in the states? In some states. That, okay. Yeah, in some states. And in some states not. That's the pragmatic approach. Okay. Like, if like this state, state, this state, you got it good. You got lots of people have coverage. You're doing good. I'll leave you alone. This state over here, hey, you guys are not doing so hot helping out your citizens. We're going to make sure that you step up your game. That's the pragmatic approach, okay? So, um, but some of the states challenged the constitutionality of, of Obamacare entirely, saying it exceeded the government's authority to regulate interstate commerce. When it went to the Supreme Court, they upheld the constitutionality of it, saying it was constitutional because it was within the scope of Congress's authority to enact on, uh, you know, things for the public good. Healthcare re reform legislation was, they said, was for the good of the people, having health insurance. And then in other areas, the Obama administration permitted state governments to take the lead, even though in this example, like with Obamacare, he was pretty heavy-handed. But in other instances, he was pretty hands-off. That's the pragmatic. Sometimes the states can take the lead, and sometimes federal government can for example, Obama allowed the state of California to impose even stricter green, greenhouse gas emissions um, 
regulations on than, than those established by the EPA. He let let them do that. He didn't say, you, no, you can't do that. We're just, he allowed them to do that. And this resolved a long-standing conflict between the states and federal government. And, uh, and it opened the door for a number of other states to follow California's lead to make stricter regulations for environmental protections. Now, not everybody's going to see progressive federalism in a positive light. Not everybody likes it. Some of them call it free-for-all federalism. It's just kind of a not very organized. It's a, it's a free-for-all. They charge that you know it'll lead to a patchwork of laws which can impact put, put negative impacts on business because different states have the majority of states will have different laws on how business is operating, and it's much more costly to meet different standards in different states than it is to meet a uniform national standard. Okay, so they they don't like that, and that's more of a conservative view of it. So, you know, and it probably is much more expensive to comply and have to know a variety of different state standards than just a mere a mere na single national standard. Uh, also, it's much more expensive when you have to go to the state legislature and lobby legislators in fifty states as opposed to just going to Congress and talking to two senators and, you know, 400 and some members of the House of Representatives instead of having to go to every state in the union and talk to their legislators. Much more expensive to do that. Uh, or even just, just talking to the EPA outright. You have that administration that does things like that. Okay? Uh, so, uh, questions about federalism, the roots of it, the different courts. So under this notion of progressive federalism, uh -huh. the that we have often guessing uh -huh. would prefer both, like dual and. Yes. And it's just it's a it, it's a pragmatic. I mean, pragmatic means I'm going to do what's best. Uh -huh. Just in my opinion, I'll do what's best. So it's not going to like doesn't have to adhere to a set principle. Like, yep, the federal government does this, the state government does that, and there's no overlap. That's not pragmatic. Pragmatic as well. In this particular instance, it's probably best that the states handle it. Or in this particular instance, it's probably best the federal government handle it. Pragmatic. Sometimes it's good, sometimes, but there are effects. Okay? you got to give and take a little bit. All right. Questions on Fed? Any other questions on Fed? Good, good question. All right. So let's take a look at Schoology for a sec. I wonder if I can expand my screen. I don't know if it's working or not, but we're going to go. Just to kind of give you a look and see what we're doing tomorrow. So we finished up Chapter 3 notes today, and we have October the 23rd is tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow you have a quiz on federalism in chapter three. Also, the other day you had, I think it was the 20th. Okay, reading guide yesterday. So make sure you get it do you get it turned in, and um, and then next week we'll have our study guide test on federalism while you got it probably Monday and Tuesday, and then I'll see you all on Wednesday, right? Okay, so be ready for that. And if at any point you guys have questions or need to get in touch with me, don't don't hesitate to contact me.